All right, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Kem Raj. I work for uh, Comcast on the RDK project, which is the uh, reference design kit. It's a very innovative name, um, which is uh, basically our set-top box operating system, which is based on Linux. Um, part of uh, my uh, work involves working with embedded Linux, but then it's also extending to um, other smaller devices like security uh, cameras and uh, sensors and stuff uh, that goes in your home for security or otherwise. And um, um, so today what we are going to talk here is about uh, some of uh, the C uh, language uh, constructs that uh, we will, uh, we, that are specific for microcontroller programming. And um, um, what I'm going to cover is, uh, um, you know, these few items, which is know your tools. Uh, very important because uh, there are several uh, tool chains, different compilers, uh, other tools that we use, and um, they all behave differently. So it's very important to know them. Um, data types and sizes, uh, you know, more uh, on embedded systems, uh, generally when you have um, general purpose uh, chips, um, you know, the, the length, the processor word lengths are known, but in microcontroller there are 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, you need to know which one it is. Uh, and then how variables and function types can help, and then what can you do in loops. And then assembly, we'll talk about assembly, it's contentious. Uh, many times it depends what you're doing, which compiler you're using. And then uh, some thoughts on uh, RAM optimizations. And then in summary, what you can do, keep in mind when you're programming for uh, microcontrollers. So um, it's an open session. Feel free if, you know, I represent something that's wrong or you feel that can be done better. I'll be very happy to discuss it further. So feel free uh, to jump in any time, um, you know. With your experiences, I would love to hear. Um, what I've done is I've uh, taken Zephyr uh, as uh, a sample here, and I'm uh, going to cover the GNU compiler mainly. So, you know, there are other vendors and other compilers which might offer more options. Uh, I'm not going to cover that here as much. So it's primarily um, around these two um, projects. Um, so knowing your tool chains, as I was saying, many vendors. There is uh, GNU compiler, and then you know IR system, ARM. Uh, there are many, um, and each compiler over there they have either added new features that are not in standards, or they have uh, uh, certain additional uh, options that are very fitting for um, you know the target micro controller they are targeting and uh, they may have, so you have to know what tools you have at hand um, and it's very important that you go through the whole documentation how they represent far pointers how they represent near pointers you know they may differ um, so if you are in for writing more portable code it's very important that uh, you can either find alternatives to those or you can uh, uh, use them in, a, in such a way that you can disable those features or have them as no ops when you are really not using, um, you know, uh, those compilers or those tools. Um, um, compiler switches. Um, so what I've seen here is I've given you a, um, a simple um, table. Uh, what I did is I took Zephyr's Hello World uh, application uh, and I compiled it with different optimization levels. And um, uh, OS definitely, uh, you know, meant for size optimization. So it, um, it basically, uh, so uh, keep in mind that this is GCC in, in purview. Um, other compilers might have different, um, you know, naming convention for this minus O options. Um, so as you can see with um, code performance, if you are really uh, looking at 
help from GCC to optimize your code max to use O2 and O3 uh, or minus O fast. So what happens is as you keep increasing your O level, um, you know, it starts getting a little bit more um, inaccurate as well. So you have to know when you change an optimization level whether your algorithm can sustain it. So uh, most of the time compilers, you know, keep in mind are tools written by other people. So I'm myself, I've, I'm a compiler developer. So those are applications too and, you know, they need help. When you feed them with the right kind of stuff, they give you good results. So um, uh, most of the time, uh, we'll cover here in this uh, talk that what can you help compiler with to get maximum out of the compiler. Um, so as you can see, the code size goes up as you increase your optimization levels. Um, but you, if you have a real world application, you would see the execution will be faster as well uh, in some cases. Um, in some cases, actually, when you do optimization for size, um, it improves your even code performance. It depends upon uh, your bus width and how you can, comp how you can utilize um, the memory um, bus. For example, if you have like 32-bit memory birth and you have 16-bit instruction set, it can improve your instruction cache usage. And uh, there are loads that when you compile, say, you know, in 16-bit may perform better compared to 32-bit. So, um, so execution time really depends upon those uh, um, uh, kind of um, um, constraints. Now, OG is relatively a new optimization that's added. What it does uh, do is during development, for example, you can use this option to get good debug view. So it doesn't give you just raw translation, which means you have highly unoptimized code. Um, but what it does is it applies optimizations that gives you a good view of debugging. So it doesn't hamper your debug view because most of the times when you enable optimizations, you start debugging and you know, it flips around. Uh, you, you don't have the logic uh, flow. And uh, when you are stepping through the code, you know, you lose the context very easily. So uh, it's, it's a good way for if you're a developer, uh, you want to kind of try out um, some debugging help and want to get good debugging experience, this is a good option to try. Uh, so uh, other item in your tools portfolio is uh, uh, your linker scripts, very important, where you place your code in, in microcontrollers. Um, so you decide uh, how, where the code goes. And um, you need to know, like GCC also has a very um, elaborate linker um, scripting language. And uh, you can really define your uh, uh, flash memory um, out um, outline and how it is loaded, which sections goes where. Um, and um, you can also define symbols and other items uh, wherever you want in your code for uh, help during execution. Um, so if you look into um, GNU linker manual, uh, they have a very elaborate um, syntax for linker uh, uh, scripting. Um, most of the time, uh, it's, uh, you know, we take a linker script and then we uh, kind of enhance it. Uh, what I've found is it's very um, interesting and important to understand all the construct that goes in and how you define your segments, what are your sections, and uh, what are your alignments, and uh, how you define your total lengths of your data uh, sections and uh, where you begin them, where you end them, how you want to initialize them. All that goes into uh, your, yeah, question. Is there any general rules of thumb for how to, uh, I mean, obviously there's a learning the language and all that, but then there's, you know, how would you organize things? Uh, yeah, right. So I think uh, the question is, is there any uh, recipe, actually a template for writing your linker scripts? Um, so I think uh, uh, generally when you uh, have, you know, it really depends on your um, architecture, how, where you are storing your code, where you are executing from, right? So many times um, you 
you store your code in Flash and then you copy it over and you execute from RAM. Right? In many times you do execution in place, right? And you're executing from Flash. Um, and then sometimes you have SRAM, sometimes you don't have SRAM, right? So, um, so what you do is uh, you basically define your data in your Flash segments accordingly and. Uh, and of course, alignments very important when where you align them, where your addresses are. So, generally, your read-write data, right, and um, and initialized data is what you consider for your flash size. And then, how much stacks? If you want stacks elsewhere, or where you want to lay your runtime uh, RAM data, all those things um, uh, basically depends upon your size. So there is no, I wouldn't say that there is a recommended way you could do it, um, but the effort of scripts is that it gives you all the tools to define your memory maps the way you want it. Um, so it's important that you read through all the keywords, what is available for you, how can you define a memory overlay, or you know how you can define other uh, important aspects of uh, your scripting uh, uh, that you would need during execution of your programs. Uh, so linker map, um, it's, a, it's a good tool to see the output of how you linked your application. Many times, you know, we link the application and we want to see where the whole thing is lying, you know, which section went where. Uh, and it kind of gives you the whole view of your memory. Um, how it is all laid out. Very important for a small application where uh, you are either doing some optimizations or you are looking at, okay, is there any dead code that got linked in? Or um, is there any code that is placed wrongly? For example, your init sections might be required at a certain address. Is it there, right? Or, um, um, you know, simple things like which function is is kind of adding a lot of code into my application. You're looking at optimizing uh, for size or maybe other reasons. So it's a very good, uh, you know, tool uh, at that point when you uh, create maps during your link step. Um, they can give you a lot of insights into how you build your application. And uh, there are also post-processing tools. At least they work with GNU Linker, uh, which can give you more. What I've given you is a, is a a dump of what linker will put at you, but if you want it in a more human readable fashion, there are tools which can take it and give you a more, uh, you know, um, view of this is how much memory it is using, or how much, um, uh, where things are, and so you can do all this kind of visualization. There are tools like that available uh, as well. Um, what it's also giving you is um, what it ignored, right? Sometimes you spend a lot of time looking at, okay, certain function was just thrown away by the linker. Um, so it also gives you that list. Okay, these, these functions or symbols I found are unused, so I decided to throw them away. All right, so you get that information. They're very good debugging help. Many times you debug through to find that a certain piece of code was thrown away. Um, so a very good um, tool, I guess, you know, to to really visualize how the whole application in the end is laid out. Um, and then Binutils also often offer a few tools which are very useful. So um, objdump, uh, one of the features I use very often is uh, minus D with uh, S. What it gives me is it, it interleaves source with assembly. So it takes your final L file and then interleaves your assembly code um, with your source code. So I get a good view of what code was generated for this particular uh, line of uh, my C code. So many times when you're looking out for various optimizations or um, maybe wrong code generation helps, um, this, this is very useful at that point when you can associate your assembly code to your C code. And uh, there is a size utility. Uh, it gives you uh, a, a size uh, that a particular application is going to take in terms of uh, text, which is your code and data and initialized, uninitialized data. So um, you, 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 this is a good uh, way, like you, know, you can keep a tap on, 
when you're adding new code, uh, you are not bloating your code. So, you know, you can put like a watch on this value and maybe you can add it to your bill system at the very end to dump the size and, and then see how much size is being added when you are um, writing code. So very important actually to regularly manage the size of your code. Uh, and alfutils, um, alfutil actually, um, uh, it's actually uh, giving you some dump of your uh, uh, application. What it shows is uh, um, you can see the program headers. So, you know, it also gives you similar information like what size does, but it's much more refined uh, where it tells you, you know, what address it is allocated, what physical address it is allocated at, and uh, flags, what kind of flags are allocated to it. So, um, so these are a few tools uh, that gives you uh, some more insights into when you're developing. These are part of uh, GNU compiler collection as well. I'm pretty sure that the tools that you'll get from other uh, vendors also have similar tools available. Um, so you can look into equivalent of those tools or maybe there are better ones. Um, so uh, now moving into like uh, what are kind of things you need to uh, keep in mind. So variables, um, you know, size is important. Um, Usually it's very important that you uh, know this, the, the word, the processor word length, which is, um, if it is a 16-bit processor, your integer is 16-bit. If it is a 32-bit processor, your integer is 32-bit. Um, so usually it's a very good way to go when you use the natural word length, that is uh, your microcontroller's processor is supporting. Um, we'll have a few examples. Uh, where, we'll show, where we will show that this is uh, how this can kind of cause inefficiencies. Um, and um, globals, um, generally globals, they have value where you, know, you can access their state, but they also have a cost. Uh, the cost being that uh, compiler cannot assume that they, their state is uh, available all the time, so it has to always load and store them. Uh, which incurs extra load stores, which can get you very inefficient code. So um, it's very important that um, you look at whether your function can deal with local data, or you can achieve what you want to do in your algorithm using local data. Um, so here is a, a little example, as you can see. Um, it's about the lengths that I was talking about. So um, this example is actually uh, from a Cortex M3 uh, code generation. And uh, what you can see here is the new, in the function, I'm using a, uh, I'm passing integers to it, and then similar function, I'm passing short integers to it. So what you can see is that the, that's the code that's generated underneath, so um, it's, also opti optimizing the code for size, so it's not a raw code. Um, so all the relevant optimizations are applied already. But you can see that there is an extra instruction that it is generating, uh, which is basically doing the sign extension. Um, so it has to do the sign extension because uh, what it sees is that uh, we are using a short integer um, on uh, to do the arithmetics and he has to ensure that uh, you know the carry bits are calculated properly, so that's why he's doing the uh, sign extension. So you can avoid you can avoid that if you know what data you are bringing in into the function. Very yeah. Yes, yes. I'm going to talk about those. I have a little slide on that. Good point. So the question was: there are fast version of uh, these integers. And um, we'll cover that too, good point. There you go. So slow and fast integers. Did you have my slides by any chance? No. Okay. okay. Um, so there are these um, extensions that are in new C standards called fast and least integer types. So this is more portable way of writing non-word length integers or uh, data types if you want to. So you have a choice there uh, where you want to, if your algorithm needs fast access or you can live with slower access. 
So it provides you these extensions um, with C11 standards um, where you, it's a uint and then you can, you can have a uint 8 underscore t. Uh, you, the least one would be uint underscore least 8t and fast 8t. Um, so this is again what I was mentioning earlier. Tell the compiler about your data. Tell the compiler about your execution, your program, and better he will do work for you. Yeah. And here it says C99.NET, so C11 at the top. Which one is it? It is C99. It's yeah. So it is C99. I think I, uh, I'll correct it before I upload. Um, um, so very good uh, uh, way to optimize your use of your integers. Um, you know, look at them. They are pretty, pretty useful. Um, because many times, you know, you can afford one or another, and uh, these things come very handy for, and they are in C standard, so, you know, all compilers who claim to be C99 compliant will have to implement it. And um, uh, sometimes um, libc's are nosy, so they provide their own understanding of these defines. So um, if you are using something, a libc with your RTOS or, uh, you know, look into that, you know, they may be overriding what compiler is providing. I at least saw that happening with Zephyr, and um, so I just wanted to share my experience that uh, I was struggling hard to see why, you know, the int types are coming out wrong. And what I saw was, you know, the includes and all, how they were lined up, they were overriding what compiler was providing as a, a standard int. So. Um, Look at that, compiler might still claim to be C99, but you might have a libc with your program that is overriding that. Um, again, portable data types. So um, many compilers I know, they provide extensions. Okay, here is a way you can represent a data. And over a period of time, C has included, you know, many of the data types that made sense into the standards. So C99, for example, has uint 8, 1632, 64T, they are very uh, portable representations. So uh, utilize them as much as you can, just don't define your own, um, because they will keep you compliant. Uh, in the past, you might have done it. I know in microcontroller programming, you have your own kind of a hosted file that you include in all your source code. Um, and then, um, you know, you define them based upon which compiler it is and all those things. You don't need to do those. If you just follow the standard and uh, expect the compiler to provide all those defines for you. Yeah. Is that standard in, not in um, I think it is uh, standard int is what you will include, but the header underneath that defines them is int types. Okay. So this is a, a sub inclusion that I think I dug too deep into it, where it is actually coming from. Um, so I just wanted to give you like, okay, if you see this file in GCC, that's where these definitions are. But if you want to um, include it in a programming, uh, in, in a program, you should include STD in. That's a very good point. Okay, so that's about um, portability of your data types. Um, so the const qualifier, you know, um, will have few examples, but it's very interesting. Uh, what you will see is um, it's again um, qualifying your, uh, your variables and your functions. You are providing an additional information to compiler uh, on, on which compiler can act. So when you say const, you are telling compiler that, okay, this data is not modified. So this can act as a hint uh, to the compiler where it can apply more aggressive uh, optimizations and um, um, it can do a lot better job of assuming what your variable that you're passing as functions is supposed to do in the quali. So he, uh, in, in, in code generation, compiler is very pessimist. So he has to generate code for all cases. So it will always, if there is a one chance to go wrong, he will not use that, unless it's very sure that it will always work most of the time. But um, by doing this, you are giving him a more uh, play, a more room to play. Um, so, uh, if you use const variables, 
uh, you can also um, let the compiler regenerate them. For example, if they are constant, already predefined const variables, for example, uh, then it can regenerate those constants uh, during execution. So it doesn't have to incur a load cost from you know, uh, memory. Um, and um, if it is stored in a slower media like flash, then you know, accessing it will cause a lot more slowness. So um, use const when you can. So here is an example uh, where you can see that uh, you know, in the, it's the same function pretty much. Um, and uh, all uh, I've done is I've defined the globals to be const in one case, and you can see that um, compiler has regenerated them in their source code. He's not doing any load stores from Flash, even though your constants are predefined, but it still has to go and load them from Flash. And um, um, such code, uh, if in loops, you know, you can, uh, you can uh, see how much impact it can have on uh, your execution path. So um, you can see in the first phase, in the first example, it is uh, loading it from a memory address, right? And then adding it, multiplying it, sign extending it, and then, uh, and then going back. But if you look in the second example, he's reconstructing it, sign extending it, and then returning. So it's a lot faster code. Uh, so const and the volatile variables, do you think such a thing can have? Can we have a constant volatile variables? Anybody? Yes, no? Okay, so can we have a const variable? Yes. So um, any examples someone can think of? Yeah. The weak, weak side of the UR. There you go, very good. So, um, so the example is a, a hardware status register, for example. Um, so uh, global variables, um, as we were also talking earlier, um, as you can see here, we defined a external integer x. And uh, when you see the code it is generating in the function below, every time he is loading it from the memory, then storing it back, and then again loading it, storing it back. Um, so this is the impact of globals that you will generally see throughout your code. Um, it doesn't matter which architecture you are on. These are uh, general problems that you will see. Um, um, so this is just a, illustrating a global versus local usage. Um, it's the same function as you can see in the first example. Um, it's global, but uh, there are these three loads and stores where it is um, um, before calling the print function. Uh, but if you see uh, on the local, um, where you are basically transferring that into a local, uh, it just knows that you know it's a local variable. I can just I don't have to worry about it changing state out of the function. So it can just uh, load it into a register, pass on to uh, call the function. So um, keep in mind when you're designing your routines, can you live with locals? In many cases, it also helps is when you are operating in a loop or so, and you really need a global, you know, you can, um, you can maybe um, transfer that local value. Um, you know if it is not modified elsewhere into a local, and then operate on it, and then store it back in the end, essentially yourself. And thereby, you are helping the compiler, again, that, uh, you know, an optimization that you are providing, and not the compiler. Um, static variables, so uh, static variables, um, um, important. Um, what I see from static variables is, again, you are making a statement about the scope of the function. So it's only available for that particular compilation unit. Um, what it can do is, uh, I mentioned here, spatial locality. Um, that's very important. What happens is, when you're linking your program, uh, linker knows these all variables are coming from same uh, module. So he puts them one after another, or at least he knows the map. So 
what happens is when they are placed one after another, and most probably you're accessing them one after another too, um, or maybe you're accessing them together in a way uh, because you're in the same function or something like that, um, it can basically add, uh, generate code where he uses a base function or a base address and then use an offset to address uh, different static variables. It can perform that optimization uh, if you're using static variables. But if they are global, then there is no way um, you know, for it. It has to assume um, that it can be anywhere in the memory. So linker cannot uh, perform these optimizations. Um, static functions. So I know many times we use macros uh, and static function, you know, it's a, uh, it's a debate. Many times people have it. Um, but one of the advantages uh, that you get from uh, static functions is uh, you let compiler decide when to inline it. Many a times compiler knows more than us. Um, you know, many times uh, it can do a better job of inlining than ourselves. So we should give it a chance to do the inlining and then optimize rather than we deciding, okay, I know what to inline, what not to inline. Um, because it knows the instruction um, um, lengths, it knows how many cycles it takes, it knows all the delays. So um, it can do a lot of calculations on total execution of functions uh, that probably, you know, it'll take us time if we are doing all those calculations ourselves. So uh, my recommendation is always give compiler a chance. And then if it uh, fails, then you kick in and then you basically help the compiler. Um, another thing it gives you is debugging. So um, when, you know, you are not writing macros but writing uh, functions in inlining, uh, or sorry, static functions, then you can debug them better. Uh, compilers have done, even I think GCC also can do um, macro debugging if you enable like the extreme level of debugging, but then you end up with a lot of um, bigger debugging data that you need to deal with in your debuggers. Uh, so this is um, pretty uh, lightweight on, on you don't have to like enable those extensive dwarf free debugging information to get all your uh, uh, macro optimizations or for, for macros. So um, the other thing is that you know during compilation where your static function is going to be laid out. Compiler knows it already. So unless you are using like whole program optimizations and stuff like that, um, the location can be pinned. So if you're calling and it's not inlined, he can still optimize your jumps. Um, it can use a static small jump. So it doesn't have to do a veneer or an indirect jump and stuff like that. So it, even it helps in you know, creating a better calling sequence. Um, so volatile, um, volatile you are um, telling the compiler that, hey, you know, uh, please don't do anything to this variable. I know this is special. Um, and uh, you want this to um, define. So what happens is the compiler doesn't unnecessarily optimize on your variable. So what happens is many times compilers have this optimizations. A, a real world example I can give you is you have a register you want to access as uh, it's an 8-bit register. Or, so you have defined it as a, a char or a U int 8T. And there are four of them in line. So you have an access to them, a read access to all four of them. A compiler can basically uh, decompose that into a integer or access-wise. He won't use LDRB, which means load byte or store byte. He will just say he will coalesce all the four because he sees they are one after another in address space. I can just make a single four byte load, right? But that's wrong because these are registers. You want to access them one after another. So it's very important that you qualify that kind of data um, with, you know, volatile, where you are telling compiler to stay away from, um, from optimizing that in any mass. Um, so um, there are, uh, Certain uh, compilers, I know, uh, proprietary ones, uh, who have some extensions to qualify 
um, volatile variables, place it here, you know, place it there. You know, they kind of give those um, hints. Um, but they, they are all non-standard. So if you are using such a compiler and you might be using that, um, be sure that that is only effective when that particular compiler is used. Um, so that makes you more portable uh, to different compiler tool chains or even architectures because different architecture may provide a different tool chain and you will be in a fix. So this helps you to port your applications quickly if you remain portable across architectures and across tools. So RH subscript versus pointer access. So again, moving um, to you know, how you can kind of represent your data. Um, so here's another, another example I tried, which is essentially same code. Um, in one case, uh, you know, what I'm doing is um, I'm using pointers uh, to access the data. And in another case, I'm just uh, using the array as such. Um, and what you can see is the uh, understanding that compiler has is different, even though the code looks same. You can see that um, uh, compiler is able to understand the pointer accesses are much uh, kind of, because if it is operating on a global data, he's loading the pointer, storing the pointer. And um, if it is doing just array subscripts, he is just, um, he, he doesn't have to do that extra pointer conversion. Um, and uh, so watch out for use of these cases. The whole uh, idea is to explain that, watch out for such use cases, look at your assembly that the compiler is generating. And uh, in many cases, you would see that results are dependent on how you have used it. Yeah. Correct, yes. So that's what, uh, you know, because many times what you do is you use a, for example, in Zephyr, we use optimize for size I was using as my default uh, level. Then uh, if you're using a different compiler, you know, it may apply that, uh, hoist, that conversion op uh, optimizations. In another case, it may not. So, so look out for that if it is not doing either Enable that switch explicitly if you need it, or understand that, okay, it's not doing the um, um, subscript to pointer access conversions. Yeah. Can you explain again why, uh, why the array version is coming up faster? Um, I think in this case, what you can see is that I'm defining a pointer, and it is not able to, alia to kind of associate that pointer that I can optimize it away. So you know, that is just illustration from the compiler point of view. If I had more aggressive optimization enabled, it probably would have identified that. Right, now you're talking about, concerned about the pointer aliasing. Yes, pointer aliasing. So if you use a strict or a Correct. something like that. You can do that, yes. You can use the restrict qualifiers. So you have to but you have, basically you have to understand that, okay, this is something if I want it to work, um, the way you know I'm accessing it, it's important to understand what compiler is generated. Right, it's because the point is aliasing to something else that happens to be global. That's happens to be, yes. Yeah. So it won't, you know, you might have to either let the compiler know that don't worry about aliasing. I know that you know it doesn't alias. No, if that were not global, if it were faster and something like that, would you still be seeing the same issue? No, we won't be seeing the same issue but uh, uh, it will still have a single load um, from the parameter list, for example, or transfer, but you won't see this issue. So loop increment versus decrement. This is, uh, 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 this is actually applicable everywhere, but what you see is um, when you are testing or you are increasing the loop, with your counter, then you have to test it against your uh, a value. When you're decrementing, um, you know, it's waiting for it to be zero. So um, architectures provide instructions to test against zero, you know, and uh, all those. Um, 
So what compiler can do is when you are decrementing your loop, it can take advantage of those instructions. And what you will see is in here, it's doing a sub s, right? And then that will set a flag. And the instruction below is doing a branch if not equal to zero. So you are able to combine, fudge together the check and the branch into one. Um, but in the case on our increment side, you will see that he has to explicitly make a check against value 100. And then that would set the flag up and then you will do a branch. So um, it can save you um, instruction. And uh, there is also a post versus pre-decrement. So whether you should use like minus minus x or you should use x minus minus. Um, so you can see that the both algorithms are actually doing same things. You know, it's going to print um, the value 10 times. Um, and, uh, but the algorithm, if you look at the code that's generated, um, the pre-increment, you can see that it's running in a, um, it, it's able to generate better code because um, um, what it is doing there is um, uh, it's able to first um, apply the operation, the increment, and then use that value throughout the loop. Um, but in other case, he has to also, uh, he has to apply the operation after the value. So um, function parameters, very important. Um, it depends upon the ABI really. So if you look at, um, say, ARM ABI, you know, that's what I was using here, Cortex M3. Um, so the document, they document it extensively and all architectures do. Um, if they have uh, a common ABI across all tools, then you know, this, they, they, they tell you how many registers can be used for parameter passing and how they are passed. So read through those for whatever microcontroller you're using and it may have ABI. ARM has a very strong ABI and all tools follow that nowadays. Um, if it needs more parameters or more registers to represent the parameters, then it's gonna use stack, which is going to be expensive. So see how you can write your function signatures that you can max, you can utilize the, you know, the given four register parameter passing uh, in a very e efficient way. So one of the things is that when you have functions, alignment also matters. So I'll just uh, show a little bit here. So what you can see is, um, you know, on an arm, R0 to R3, those are the four, para uh, four registers you have. But you see in the first function, what I'm doing is I'm taking an int a long, long and int, right? So, and in the second function, I'm doing a int, int, long, long, right? So in effect, you need four registers to pass them. But the problem with the first um, example is that he will align the, and the, 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 the long, long because it's eight bytes long. So he would be able to use two registers for that um, but then one of the registers will go empty because of the alignments. So in the end, what you will see is that, you know, he is spilling into the, into the stack pointer, your third parameter. So, so these things can help you a lot when you are, um, you know, using these parameters. So inline assembly, um, it's, it's, yeah. Less likely, yes. But okay. Um, so inline assembly is, um, you know, uh, use it uh, when you have to. Um, in many cases, compiler may not be able to generate the instructions you want to use. Say, you know, you're you are accessing a particular coprocessor or something. Um, using inline assembly helps you to insert those into your normal C programs 
and it helps GCC to take care of the data flow analysis. So it will be able to, uh, you know, uh, take that code and um, assemble it into a C function. Um, so uh, intrinsics is one good example. Um, and uh, there are, as I said, special instructions if you have any. Um, so I've given a link here for GCC's inline assembly syntax. It's uh, quite cryptic, and, uh, but it's well explained. So you can read through it and see how if you can use it efficiently. So it has uh, qualifiers that lets you define what is the different register, uh, what are different inputs and outputs, and what are the constraints on those. Um, and I've seen other compilers have them too. Their syntaxes vary. So uh, it, it is actually one of the most, um, uh, it's most common case that you'll see when you're porting your program from one compiler to another, uh, that your inline assembly just doesn't work. Um, so I think optimizing for DRAM, um, use smaller data types. We talked about that, uh, but when you, use smaller data types, you're using less memory. So it can help you if you're, uh, you know, on a, on a RAM constrained, con constrained system. Uh, use, pad use kind of um, a, a compressed structures. Uh, there are packed structs in, I think, all kind of compilers. They support them. So use that uh, or reorganize your data structure so you don't have much padding in between those, if you can. In many cases, you can't because, say, it's a network parameter or something or a IP header that you can't do much about it. Um, and uh, know about the local variables, use them uh, as much as you can. And uh, for example, you see, if you use alloca, uh, you know, you, you will see in the code that it doesn't release that memory, even though you think yeah, I'm using it locally, it won't release it until you return from the function. So be aware of those kind of uh, details. So you're still using that memory you allocated uh, until the end of the function. So if you want to release it, you have to make uh, a calls for free in between. Um, merge constant com uh, optimizations. Um, you know, in RISC, very important that it can reconstruct some constants. Uh, as we saw one example where it was trying to do that, and that helps quite a lot. Um, and then you can check your stack and heap usage and see if you are having an additional allocation there that you are not hitting a limit, for example then you, know, you can limit uh, how much stack or heaps you decide to allocate um, for your app. So you can have uh, kind of more or less, uh, you can use uh, less RAM for. So help the compiler out. Throughout this, I've been mentioning that. Uh, it doesn't have a magic crystal ball, so you, it operates on what you give it. Um, and it makes worst case assumptions as we talked about. Point aliasing is one good example that if it sees there is a chance for pointer to alias, it will assume it will alias. So he's gonna give you the worst case scenario and a bad code there. Um, and the global data, if you use a lot of global data, then it knows that it's not immutable. So he has to, every access you make, he's gonna load store. And uh, do while is better because you are decrementing than for loops. Um, one reason is that um, the termination check can be performed. Um, and uh, you can use the compiler provided annotations also to help the compiler. Uh, function attributes, variable attributes, pragmas. You can tell a lot about your code to the compiler to help him um, give you the best code. And there are intrinsic functions. You can use them uh, for optimizing your code. Uh, again, intrinsic functions are compiler specific, so watch out for those. Um, be mindful that uh, you know a different compiler may have a different different calling convention or stuff like that. Um, so stay away from debug mode and release mode um, because you want to develop the code that you want to run in production. Period. Um, um, so if you want to be you know a consistent. Uh, see whether you, how much debugging you can uh, afford and how much optimizations you can afford. More over a period of time, using the same code generation for debugging and production is the way to go. Um, find system, details about your system, architecture, bus lengths, memory types, flash sizes, um, and latencies, and very important. 
and uh, profile your code before you optimize anything. Most of the time, we jump onto a solution and it's wrong. Um, so use tools as much as we can. That gives you a really good picture of what your app is doing. And then utilize the tool, don't fight them. Most of the time, uh, there is a reason why they are doing what they are doing. So um, help them to help you. If you help them, they'll help you back. And uh, avoid assembly if you can. You write everything in C. Um, so that's pretty much I had. Um, any questions? Uh, we are open right now. So we are almost out of time. So if uh, there are a few questions, yeah. Help. It is um, when you know that your data is not changing, it's good to use it. It's always good to use it because it's telling the compiler that yes, this is a constant data that I don't have to always reload from memory. So if it can re uh, reconstruct it, it will. Yeah. yeah. There was sorry, there was another question in the. I don't know. Um, yeah, so. Yes. So. Yes. That's OG. Yeah. So one more last question. You had some? Right. On, on pointer aliasing, um, so basically if the compiler has to assume that anything can alias anything. And that's usually true. But for GCC, there's the strict aliasing yes. issue as well, right? Yes. Where it actually won't do that. But then you have another set of issues. Like yes, yes. So I think um, it's always good, in theory, to represent yourself in terms of aliasing come out clear. So that is the best scenario I've seen, where you don't really let compiler uh, trigger, and you tell him clearly that I'm not aliasing. So thank you very much, and uh, um, it was a pleasure. <laughs>